Hello, this is Mark Lefebvre from draft to digital but you can call me Mark to digital That's so much easier. I am delighted to have in the virtual studio with me today, Terry Odell. Terry, welcome to the draft digital spotlight. Thank you for having me. This should be fun. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this because I'm going to pop a little something else up on the screen just to show people because I'm, I'm really, I was intrigued the, the first time I met you of your brand. You started off with Terry, obviously Terry O'Dell, romance with a twist of mystery. Before we get into specific questions about your writing, I really want to find out, was it mystery or was it romance that you were first drawn to when you wanted to, then you knew you wanted to be a writer? I was a mystery reader. I love mystery books. I read nothing but mystery books. And one day on a whim, I thought I'd see if I could write. I mean, I no background in writing, no education in writing other than I could put words together in a sentence. I was a reader. <laughs> Started writing this book that was going to be this mystery. And my kids, my daughters were grown, but I would send them chapters. And they reached a point where they said, Mom, this is a romance. And I go, I don't have a romance. How can I possibly be writing a romance? And they gave me a paragraph. They both quoted the same paragraph when the cop took her out after her store had been robbed. He took her out to calm her down. And she looked into his eyes and noticed that the brown eyes were really flecked with hazel. So I tried to learn how to write description and it turned my book into a romance. So then I had to start reading some romances and I didn't like them. Uh, I found romantic suspense, and that seemed to be the way to blend mystery with romance. <clears throat> and uh, I realized that when I read mysteries, I was reading series, and I was reading them twice, usually once to follow with the character, what Spencer doing with Susan in this book, and then go back and, and read, you know, oh, wait, there's a crime. I, I, sh I should know about that, too. So that's how I got that started. Really? Wow. And so when you, is, this is funny, when you were talking about that scene, was that the first book in the Pine Hills Police series? That was Finding Sarah. That was Finding Sarah. Yeah, because I read that. I love that book. I was like, I know that scene. That was awesome. <laughs> so I find it funny that uh, you kind of accidentally found that you were writing romance in the mystery. That It was just part of what you were sharing. It, it seemed to be natural, but you didn't even know the tropes you were playing off of. Not, not at all. I, you know, trope is still like a weird word to me. It's like, I just do what I want. Nobody ever told me how I had to do it. So I, I hooked up with a, a writing group in Orlando when we lived there, a live group, and they were all going back to school as changing careers or, or mature women looking for a new outlook. So they were giving me all of their class information. It was like I was getting that course for free because I'd write something. Oh, no, you know, you can't do that. Or just because it's right doesn't mean it's good. You got to fix it. So that's, that's how I, I got everything going. Okay. That's that's fascinating. So uh, we mentioned the Pine Hill Police series, which I have mm -hmm. uh, enjoyed the, at least uh, the beginning of that series. I haven't made it all the way through yet. But you Jim. have three other uh, three other universes or three other series that you write in. Are they all uh, mystery or uh, romantic suspense, mystery with a romantic twist? Uh, no, I have four, I think, because I wrote a trilogy that was a romantic suspense, uh, the Western, because it's a good excuse to go on a uh, cattle ranch and spend a week there and write it up because you're researching. Sounds like a good tax write-off for uh, for yeah. research. Well, the next book, that was my trip to the British Isles. <laughs> yeah. um, then the, the Pine Hills, those are romantic suspense. The Blackthorn are covert ops romantic suspense. Okay. But the mysteries are straight mystery, although they don't follow any of the rules there either because sort of police procedurals, but a cozy feel. And I don't read cozies either, so I didn't know that. <laughs> You'd accidentally <laughs> realized you were writing something, and your daughter said, wait a second, I know what's going on here. Yeah, no, and that one was the one where I thought, well, now I can really write a mystery. I've written eight other books, and I had to write a book. I can write a mystery. And then when I was trying to get it published, the agents and the editors that I, I would spoke to said, it's really good, but it 
we can't sell it because we don't know if it's a cozy or a mystery. So make up your mind and rewrite it. And I go, no, I'll just, you know, by then you could indie publish. And readers don't care what shelf it came off of in the bookstore. They just want to enjoy what they enjoy, right? So uh, a mystery with a twist of romance is exactly the drink they ordered, right? <laughs> <laughs> or romance with a twist of mystery. So was was there a time that you were interested in traditional publishing, and then did did you move into indie? How did when did that happen for you? Okay, I started writing probably around <clears throat> two and three ish, uh, maybe before that, just just playing with it because I was goofing off with fan fiction because of my son. Um, I first got into well, there was no indie publishing, so you you did have to go out and try it, you know. So you try to find an agent and you try to find a publisher. And that was when e-publishers were springing up. Dolores Cave was huge. They started the ebook craze, revolution, whatever you call it, okay. uh, because they wrote erotica. And readers of erotica did not want to walk into the bookstore and grab the book and carry it up to the counter where a kid they knew was you know, working summers behind the counter. Uh, so they were reading on, um, not iPads, rocket book was the format. Um, now I'm, I'm drawing a total blank. What did you call it? PDAs? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Those little PDA devices. Yeah. And that was how you read the book. Or you sat in front of your computer and read them. And if you wanted to buy one, you went to the website of that publisher and downloaded the book. Right. When Alaris Cave decided they were going to try a new imprint, mainstream, no erotica, you know, just romance, but mainstream romance. Right. And they accepted Finding Sarah. Their marketing idea tanked because people that were reading erotica did not cross over. So you weren't selling like those erotica uh, authors were, but it was getting in the door. And then there was Wild, Road, Ro Wild Rose Press. Yep. And I got, uh, they took short stories. I had written this wonderful little, I don't know, 1800 word short story. It had been approved for a magazine that went out of business before it was published. So here I had something that had validation and I didn't know where to put it. And then Wild Rose came up and they were doing short stories. So I kind of got into that. And then when I had a traditional publisher, a five-star hardcover library focus, and they didn't understand the marketing trends that were coming up. So I had the e-rights to that, those books. So when they remaindered them, I had to wait a year and then I could do it. And then that's when the Kindle showed up. And that's when J.A. Conrad said, hey, put your books up for 99 cents. You know, people will buy them. Well, they bought his books, but <laughs> more than just putting it up there before people bought no, I, I think I think they were buying your books, too, because I have to share this comment that Ray had popped up early in the conversation saying, I just finished listening to What's in a Name, uh, one of your uh, novels. I absolutely loved it. Thanks for writing this wonderful book. So obviously there are people buying and reading and enjoying <laughs> yeah. your, your novels. Thanks yeah. for sharing that, right? Yeah. But it, it wasn't just a matter of popping it up there and the next morning you would have, you know. That's true. <laughs> thousands and thousands of copies. It's slow. So let's talk about the process then. How how did you begin that process of getting folks like Ray, who obviously you've just listened to, obviously you have an audio book. Or maybe maybe he was lucky enough to have someone read it to him. That would be awesome. I, yeah, I doubt that. No, I have fifteen audiobooks. Okay, and we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that soon. Yeah. I want to ask you about that process. But oh, right. the, the the process. How how did you start? Uh, you obviously must have an author newsletter. I have a newsletter. Uh, that wasn't the start when I had my short story accepted by Wild Rose. Okay. Brand new. You know, no idea. They they just wanted to try something, and there's one of the few that is still in business, still doing well, uh, they said, you need a web page, you need a blog. So, you know, they were my publisher. So I created a blog and just started chatting, just putting stuff up. And uh, I still have that blog. It's changed a lot, but yeah. 
that's a, a way I catch readers. And then Facebook showed up. And so I had a profile and then they allowed you to do an author page. So I have an author page on Facebook and that's where we have a lot of fun. Every day I put up the word of the day from dictionary.com and everybody makes up crazy definitions. Oh, really? And it's a great game. And it, it gets, and those people have started to know each other. And they start commenting back and forth. To each other, you know, I was going to say that. How could you do that? So that's, I, I put that up first thing in the morning. And then in the evening on that page, I post some stupid meme that's caught my eye. Uh, so uh, usually funny. And I just put those up. And then in between, I may talk about, you know, this is the last sentence I wrote. and I don't know what's coming next. Or I need a character name. Always. <laughs> <laughs> character names. So that's kind of like my play. My playground is my author page on Facebook. Really? Oh, that is cool. I love that. It, it seems like that engagement then obviously is really, really valuable to you uh, as an author. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you live where I do, that's like the only engagement you get. Well, let's talk about where you live because I am jealous because <laughs> uh, I think uh, you sent me a picture that I want to share uh, with people here. I think this is I think this is your is this your view that we're seeing? Yeah, yeah that was morning or t morning before last on my deck sunrise. Oh my goodness! Oh my god, that is gorgeous. Morning before last sunrise. Oh. Uh, how do you get any writing done when you can just be sitting there looking at a few like that? <laughs> Close the blinds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, right now I've got the hummingbirds are just starting to come back and the feeders outside one of my office windows. And I, I have to <laughs> let my husband know when he runs out with the camera. <laughs> so we can speak of wildlife in my yard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me there again. I've got more images to share as you're sharing this story. So uh, let's talk about. Uh, was it a visitor you had? <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little kid came by, climbed our tree, and um, this guy my, here. Yeah, my husband took the picture. The dog has learned when she hears the camera shutter because he puts it on motor and it goes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And she goes running into his office to look out the window. I said, what, what are you taking pictures of? And uh, so when I wrote uh, Deadly Places, I needed a cover. And so we, I got with my cover artist and he took that. And so this was a photo your husband took of, the, the of your friendly neighborhood Yogi Bear that came to check things out. Right. And then your cover it's designer. Peter, and then the cover artist adds the background and it was a fall set book around Halloween. So we added the pumpkin, you know, I, I can't do that. My son could do that, but he doesn't want to. That's not what he does right. he for me. And said, mom, that's it. <laughs> and you know what I never even noticed is on the cover of the, the L in deadly is, a, is yeah. a knife. I never even noticed that before. That is awesome. Yeah. That, that was the, the cover artist for the, that I was using at that time. He's retired since then, but he's been generous enough to say, sure, you can have the fonts and, and all of that. Oh my so God. that deadly is in all the Mapleton books. Now, speaking of brand, I, I believe there was a time when you had to re re update your, your covers. I remember reading that either on your blog or something uh, way back. Mm -hmm. So what was that experience like where you had had a bunch of books out and then you had to redo them all. And what was that all about? Uh, the publisher that I had for my hardcover for the library books, they bought one book at a time. Their art department did a cover based on that book. There was no connection to them. There was nothing that said they were the same author. They were related. Right. So I went through and said, okay, let's try to take the same covers or as close as we can get because, you know, the publisher owned the artwork. I got the rights back to the inside of the book, but not the outside. Right. Uh, and we did, uh, came up with the font for my name that's consistent all the way through. All of them have, yeah. Oh, there. There. With the same the same uh, font, et cetera, yeah. Okay. Right. So the series right. might be different, but my name is the same on every book, regardless of what, what series it's in. Okay. Uh, that was better. I like, you know, it gave the continuity and then I, I just 
got to the point where you have to reach a point where you're, it's not about you. What you like is not marketing. Right. I, I you know, I hated the, the romance covers with the couple in the top floating in air kissing or something like that. I didn't want a, a floating heads cover and I didn't want this and I didn't want that. And I didn't want people on my covers at all because I didn't like the clinches, uh, but they weren't selling as romance. They weren't automatically obvious that they were romance. And I can see that in the reviews. There's sex in this book. I didn't want the, what my husband calls, there's mushy stuff. <laughs> So we we went and I, I got with my current cover artist and I said, okay, it's not about me. It's not about what I like. Let's put a hunk on all the Blackthorn books so that it's pretty obvious what they're getting. And then we went through with the Pine Hills book. And it's really hard to find a couple on a cover that looks like what you've written, unless you're smart enough to find the couple and then write the book. <laughs> I, I can't do that. I, I just, you know, it doesn't occur to me. So we, I went with shadowy figures. Okay. A couple in shadow so that it didn't matter what they looked like. You could just tell there's people in the story and it's likely to be a romance. Okay. And the mysteries, they all have that crime scene tape on them. Oh yeah. I know. Yeah. That, that crime scene tape is uh, for the mysteries, right? Or right across yes. the, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Deadly bones. Okay, cool, mm -hmm. excellent, and that and that that really is part of the, the genre. So when people see the crime scene tape, they know right. they're going to get some police procedural, some mystery. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the logo, I think you've got a slide of it, but I have my my. Oh, mug. you've got your mug, your logo everywhere. Yeah, there's the the yeah. romance with the twist of mystery as you as you wreck everything in the background there. Yeah. <laughs> I hope the mug's still okay. Yeah, the mug is fine. The water glass didn't break. I'm in good shape. So, um, yeah, where did that come from? Like, that was a gift from my daughter. Ooh, really? I had a, you know, when Wild Rose said, you got to have a website. And I go, I don't know. And you come up with something. And so my son, who is a photographer, put together a <laughs> twist uh, of mystery with the lemon twist, like in a martini. Okay. And that was my cover for for or my, my, I don't know what you call it, logo for, for a while. And then when I started moving into more books and it became serious and this wasn't just a fun little thing, uh, I asked my daughter if she could do anything with it. And she had a friend who's a, a graphic artist over, uh, he's either in England or Ireland or where she is. Right. And he designed that. And I love it. You know, it's just perfect. It's that, that heart and the dagger. And uh, so that's where that, that was just a birthday present one year. Oh, my God. I, I really like your daughter. Not only did she help you identify that, uh, but then the, uh, the yeah. yeah, that is really cool. So so uh, any any children or, or siblings or, or spouses of authors who happen to be listening to this, a really great gift for an author is either you know, some professional design for a logo, for a branding. So so branding is obviously very important to you. You've got the yeah. mug. Now, is that stuff for, is that for your fans as well when they, when you're at events or how does that work? If I'm at events, not the mug, because those are too fragile and costly. And as we I, saw, yes. As a sample, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have notepads, I have post-its, I have pens. The the one that people love the most is my lip balm. Yes. <laughs> well, especially it. where you live, right? Where it can be dry. And oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In Colorado, I can give that stuff out like crazy. <laughs> um, so if I go somewhere where I'm going to see people, yes, or if I have a, a giveaway, tuck one of those in, or I'll, I'll just do a, you want to win some swag, and give it away. So you just figure, I don't know that they'll buy the book, but if they see your name on a 25 sheet notepad, that's 25 times they've seen your name. Right. So. That's awesome. So let's, uh, we, we, we hinted at audiobooks. You have 15 audiobooks. How many, how many books do you have published actually in total? You know, I was thinking of that before we started. So he's going to ask me how. More than 15, I'm assuming. Right. I think, I think I have, 21 novels okay and then there's shorts 
novellas. Right. I've got a collection of shorts, two collections of short stories, and then I've got some bundles. So I don't know if you can call that. Sure. I wrote those books individually, and I put them together a couple of years later. So 25 titles, roughly, I'm guessing. Something probably, like yeah. Okay. And 15 audiobooks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did not put the Blackthorns into audio simply because at the time there were already six or seven of them. And it's just too expensive. You know, because right. if you do one book, it is, one leads to the next. So if you can't get all of them, now there's nine of them. And if you can't get nine of them up there, that's a, a long time to get your money back on an audio book. Well, and that's a, yeah. So you you must have started this uh, way back, actually. I, yeah, I just looked. My first audio book um, is coming up to the seven year mark with ACX. Seven years. So um, you you were initially you're counting that because initially you did the royalty share. Is that how you did it? Yeah, because at the time I got it, I got an email from an author friend who said, "Terry, you got to do this." You know, it doesn't cost you anything. And, you know, it's an extra hundred bucks a month in, in your pocket, which was all my goal ever was then. I thought, you know, okay, a hundred bucks. And there was no investment. I paid $25 for the cover. But you got royalty share. They gave the narrators a stipend. So the narrators were eager to do it because they knew they were going to make money up front. It, it wasn't a gamble. Now that there's so many other gateways into audio i wouldn't recommend going that way what, what would you recommend what's the process that you're right now using now right now i'm using find a way find a way voices okay um and i done that kind of through the back door as well it they are more expensive to get a narrator through them they they tack on like 15 percent right. of what a narrator would charge um but they will take a book, and I've worked with my mystery narrator long enough that he trusts me. And I, you know, will will you narrate this book, and I'll pay you, but not until it's done. And he said, "Sure." And because you've worked together before. Yes, he's done all my Mapletons. Okay. And uh, he's also very good about not wanting or requiring money when I when I had one of the Mapletons in royalty share, he did not ask me to buy him out. He just said, you know, because he's smart. He looked back and said, you know, in, in four years we sold 89 copies. I'm not making any money anyway. <laughs> I'll take the money up front. Thank you. <laughs> you, you know, I'll just yeah. you know we got them to all the rest he did I did as a per finished hour with him. Okay. That's cool. So it, it sounds like trust and relationships with people in the industry, like your your narrator, editor, designers, the people that you work right. with. That's obviously really important to you. I think you need a relationship with them. They have to know that that you're good for whatever you're coming up with and that you're you know, with my cover, the cover artist, she's not she doesn't charge until she's done and, and you say, Okay. It, it's not like, you know, give me a hundred bucks up front and I'll see what I can do for you. Right. Um, my editor, I've been with her since the five star books. I think there are only two books that I used a different editor for when she was not taking on clients. So, yeah, I mean, she knows me and, and she knows when she, I say I've got a book for you. She knows about how much work it's going to be. Well, because you've done that repeatedly, I'm right? So it's predictable. Correcting my grammar and my typos. <laughs> there won't be a lot of them. <laughs> That's fantastic. And so, uh, the, the audiobooks, in, in all in all realistic um, the fashion, it's not like you made an audiobook, kind of like the J.A. Conrad days. You stuck it up, and a bazillion people bought it, and you became rich. You're in this for the long run. You have to, you know, you have to be. I'm. I went to a uh, Novelist Incorporated conference when audiobooks were just starting and they had several authors up there with the ACX rep and they were talking about how, you know, I'll mortgage my house to pay for my audiobook or, or, or whatever else. And then the next year they're going, well, I, I haven't made my money back yet. And they're looking and they're, you know, 
general opinion if you're a, a mid-list wannabe, five years. Okay. So it's, it's yeah, you're thinking of a longer term. Yeah. Right. Which is probably why ACX has that seven-year contract. One of the reasons is, well, you got to give it some time <laughs> for everyone to get their money back, right? Right. Yeah. 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 The, the royalty share is, is the one that really locks you in. I. That's a that's a toughie. I went through nightmares trying to get the the one book, the one Mapleton book, Deadly Bones, uh, out of the royalty share, and and uh, it was a nightmare. Do you have uh, any opinions about um, exclusivity versus wide? <laughs> yeah, you. <yeah. laughs> um, wide. And why? Why is that? First off, you you never know where you're going to find a reader. But I I have to be fair and honest. I'm retired. My house is paid for. My cars are paid for. I don't have kids living at home. Uh, I don't put a roof over my head or food on my table with my royalties. But so I am the kind of person back in the day when somebody asked me if one of my books would be on all romance ebooks, she said, because that's where I buy my books. And my answer to her was tomorrow. And I. Because she's a reader, and who knows how many other readers she's going to tell about it. And I also just, quite honestly, I, I'm very concerned that the the big guy can change the terms at any time. You're locked in there, and you say you've got all the rights, and you know, I'm not making all my money on page reads. And then they say, well, we're not going to pay that much money for page reads. It's still my biggest income source not not the patriot thing I, you know i have my books there uh you have to buy them but i have four free ones first in series is free um so i i just make most of my money there but i make enough from apple and kobo and uh barnes and noble that i, I couldn't give that income up I, I i wouldn't risk it and i think that's what the people say going the other way I'm making this much money with, with Kindle Unlimited. I, I can't risk taking them down. Right. You know. Okay. So let's talk a little yeah, bit about that. Oh, sorry. No, that's, that was nothing. Oh, uh, I know you're in the mountains. The, the, the signal seems to be just wavering there. It's like a, a Star Trek transmission, but that's okay. We'll keep going. Uh, I, I do know okay. because you, that's the price you pay for all that beauty, I guess. But yeah. um, you talked about free first books, and, and mm -hmm. so you have four series, and the first book in each series is free. That's like perma-free everywhere? Uh, three of the series. The okay. Pine Hills Police, the Mapleton, and the Blackthorn. My, my cowboy books, there's only three of them, and it really doesn't pay to, to knock the price down until you have enough other books. Um, I... Yes. I mean, those things bring in people. It's, it's not immediate. Uh, when you advertise and you promote free in some of the sweepstakes type deals, um, you know, here and sign up for the newsletter and you can have 30 authors and 30 books and, and all of that. There's a lot of glommers out there. There's people who go, I've got more books on my Kindle than I can read in my lifetime and I haven't paid for one of them. Right. That's not my audience. You know, um, but I'm I'm willing to say, you've never heard of me. Here's a book. Read it. If you like it, there'll be a whole lot more. And they're good for giveaways and, and for prizes or, or whatever. You can just tell people, look, here's a free book. And yes, they're perma-free. Cool. Well, I think I discovered uh, Pine Hills Police because book one was free. But because I was commuting a lot, I ended up going and buying the audio book anyways. <laughs> Uh, which is, yeah. 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 And that's the other thing, too, is those first in series free books in audio tend to sell better than the rest because if you buy the ebook and the audiobook, and the ebook is free, and so the audiobook only costs you five or six bucks. Um, my best selling audiobook at ACX 
is the bundle because it's a subscription service. So people are going, right. why should I get my credit for a $12 book when I can use it for a $25 book? Yeah. So the yeah. bundles do much better at ACX. Oh, that's Auto. fantastic. Yeah, because it's yeah. way a better deal for the $15 right. a month, right? Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Cool. So we're at the uh, we're at the half hour mark. So we're going to start taking some questions uh, from our live audience. And the first question uh, comes from Carla, and Carla asks, "How long does it take you to write a book, and how do you decide what to write next?" Okay, uh, on a non stressful universe, <laughs> about three or four months to write a book, they average about 100,000 words. I shoot for 80 and I end up at 100 and I publish them at 90. Uh, as far as deciding what to write next, it's whatever strikes my fancy. Right now, what I decided to write next was a book set in the British Isles so I can write off my trip. But it's a standalone and then that's not gonna be fun. But for variety, I, I tend to bounce my series around. So I go, okay, I've been, you know, I need a new Blackthorn guy or, you know, I've just spent too much time with Gordon. He's got to have a break before his next case. And, and whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, every now and again, I think I've had, you know, like a reader say, I really like this series. When is your next one going to be out? And I'll think, well, I can write that. So the readers that you engage with asking questions is sometimes a prompt to say, oh, I guess I should revisit them. Yeah. Okay, cool. I mean, I'll, I'll just look at just about anything. Anything to avoid cleaning toilets. <laughs> so I have to ask because we've talked about the British Isles twice. Okay. Was it the was it the characters and the setting and the idea that brought you there or was it Terry and her husband really want to go there and this is a great tax write-off. Don't worry, the IRS is not listening. I hope not. Um, <laughs> my daughter, one of my daughters lives in Northern Ireland. She was here visiting and pointed out that she's lived in Northern Ireland for 12 years and we had never visited. Okay. We had a 50th anniversary coming up and we said, let's go visit Jess, but let's take a, a tour. And we got with a travel agent who set us up on a tour, which then nobody else signed up for the tour. So we ended up with a private driver and got to do a lot of stuff. Just It was fun because they would take us where they did. Oh, you've got to see this. There's this guy with these sheepdogs. And one speaks Gaelic and one speaks English. And, and you know, <laughs> okay, we'll go see that. So, yeah. And then I asked my, you know, tax guy. And said, you know, can I really write off this whole trip? <laughs> it's basically because you don't have a plot in mind when you go, so you're not looking at things. So every day, everything you see is a, a plot idea. So it's important. So he said, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about that. You say everything you see is a plot idea. Is that true uh, for you as a writer? Uh, a lot of times. Yeah, I'm... I'm I mean, some of it you look and say, oh, well, that would be boring. But, you know, when, when we go places um, with with my husband and, and we meet people and he, he will say, watch what you say. She's a writer. It'll end up in a book. So, you know. Does he have a T-shirt that says that or you say that? Uh, you know, don't, don't annoy me. I might show you in my next book. Yeah. 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 Careful or you'll end up in my novel. <laughs> is there a setting like Pine Hills or Mapletown? Uh, are they places that you've, are they based on places that you've actually lived or are familiar with? Pine Hills is based on uh, visits to my husband's sister in Salem. Okay. So I did that. And then I thought she was getting sick of me having to keep emailing her. It's May. What? trees are blooming in the streets and, and all that. So I set the next one in Orlando and found that was harder because it was real. You know, I made, I made the, the character a deputy with the oh, Orlando. Okay. It's like a real character. location, not a fictional. Okay. And that was real. And that was spooky because, you know, I called, met this guy who was teaching SWAT um, aerobics or something like that at the Y. And so I asked him questions and I called him one day and I said, you know, what color is the carpet? 
And he goes, I don't know, Gray, whatever. You want to go for a tour? And I said, sure, you know. And so I, you know, and he walked me through everything and let me ask all the questions and, and all of that. So I tried to be accurate, but I felt like it had to be much more accurate than saying, okay, this police, you know, that's where my Blackthorns came in. They need a fancy ass helicopter. I can give them one. I don't have to worry about the police department can't afford that. Oh, that's fantastic. So, so for the research that you do, because of it's police and uh, mm -hmm. mysteries and stuff like that, um, how often are you reaching out to experts in the field to, to kind of glean their insights and, uh, you know, not just the color of the carpet, but maybe investigations okay. and things like that? Whenever I need it. You know, I get to the point in the book where I go, well, wait a minute, you know, how can this guy, you know, uh, he's going to get stabbed in the liver, you know, or I'm going to stab, you know, how long will it take, you know, and, and you just ask, or I've, I've called, I've talked to the coroner in Jefferson County. Uh, the, the fun part is, is that they normally will uh, tell you much more that they'll tell you how to solve the thing. Well, just send all to Texas and they'll tell you who, you know, well, then the book is over in chapter three. <laughs> can't identify them. You know? Well, maybe like you come up with an, a reason why they can't do the thing, which exactly. is why the mystery drags yeah. on, right? So, uh, so right. another reader might go, wait a second, why didn't they just send it to Texas? <laughs> right, yeah. And you say, well, because there were no teeth left. Are there any times when you've reached out to a coroner or an uh, investigator or <laughs> a law <laughs> enforcement officer where um, they wondered? <laughs> it's kind of like, hi, I'd like to inquire about some murders or whatever. <laughs> like, it was like, I, I normally lead off with, I am a writer, I'm working on a novel. Okay. Yeah. Usually you let them know up that up front. Yeah, so it's right, not right, right up front. That, that's my lead in. What's the response? How do they normally respond to that? Is it, oh, I'm too busy. I, I can't talk to you because it's just this righty, this fluffy righty thing you're doing, or do they actually take Most that? Most of the time they're flattered that you want their opinion and they want to help and make sure you get it right. They don't want to be portrayed in a bad light. Okay. So they will go on and on and tell you stuff that, you may never even be able to use, but I've, I've never really had some. I usually start with email now. Okay. So I figure if they're busy, they just don't answer. So what's uh, so for other writers who are interested in reaching out and, and talking to experts, it doesn't have to be you know mm -hmm. uh, law law enforcement officials. What do you recommend? Uh, how how do you approach that as a writer? I use a contact I've, I've found people on facebook i needed to know stuff about flying and i put something uh you know i think i typed pilots and i got names and, and looked at their profiles or whatever and messaged one and he came back he was great and uh gave me all the information that i would need i thought and then he called me on the phone he got my number and he called me and he said, I told you something wrong. That the plane you're using, you know, that requires a co-pilot. You you have to have two people up there, kind of thing. So you either get another character or you change the he says you can make it this kind of a plane. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's cool. People just like to help. And is that a thing where uh, you have an acknowledgement section and you talk okay. about who, yeah, and, and and whether or not they, they, they allow you to say their name? I, I will ask first and say, you know, I have to think, can I, can I use your name and how would you like it? Because sometimes they want you to say, you know, detective, retired, da-da-da-da, and list it. And sometimes they go, I don't care what I see, which is fine. <laughs> I just want to read the book. Yeah, I just want to read the book when it's done. I want to make sure you got it right. <laughs> yeah. Some of them will. My 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 Orlando cop. He he does read them, and he says, you know, I he I've, I've got enough of a relationship with that I can send him a scene, and say how is it? Did I know I I'm right. a stranger. You know, I I would go through with scenarios and ask questions, and we would do it all by email. But with with Mark, I can just email it to him and and say, did I did I get this right? You know. You know. He'll, the other guy needs to go in the back door. You know, they don't both go in the front or, or whatever. 
<laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Cool. <laughs> well, thank you. This is awesome. I'm getting all kinds of great uh, material here. We have another question uh, from the live audience. We have uh, Danielle asks, um, do you have any tips for <sighs> aspiring first time author? Uh, write and read and read, read what you like, read what you want. Uh, right now with, with the ability to, to publish, you have to decide if you want to do it traditionally, if you want to do it um, through indie, if you're going to do it indie, don't be in a hurry because it won't be as good as you think it is. Get an editor, get somebody professional to, to look at it because that's your only chance, your first and last chance. If you put up stuff that you think is good because you speak English, so why can't you write English? Uh, you'll, you'll kill your career. Um, find critique partners, find critique groups. I, it was pointed out to me, one of my critique partners lives in London. So we actually got together for fish and chips and beer at a, a pub across the road from where Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. And yes, that is in the book. Yeah. Um, you added that to the book, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I hadn't written the book yet, but I go, you know, this, this pub is going to be in there. Uh, and he said, we've been together 14 years now. It's uh, amazing. You know, I, I can't imagine, but I've, I've been with this critique group for up to 14 years. Uh, and, you know, we pull no punches. I guess that's really, that honesty is, is very important because you don't want to put out an inferior product, right? Right. If, if you've got people who are saying, oh, this is great. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. You know, that's not your group. I got a group because I was writing Finding Sarah and the, the moderator of the group, it was online. And she says, oh, don't let anything bad happen to Sarah. Don't let anything else bad happen to her. Well, <laughs> you know. Doesn't make for an interesting story then. <laughs> happy people in happy land does not sell books. <laughs> Kids, but. Well, no, but that's true. I mean, but I mean, two two, two important things happen there, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, people in peril and turmoil change. Very uh, valuable. Uh, the um, the stakes need to be important. Mm -hmm. But then you also have the flip side is wow, they care that much about Sarah. That's a pretty yeah. awesome thing. Yeah, and and I I do appreciate that. You know, I'm I'm really glad. Or usually now it's the reviews who will tell me something. I got one. No person in her right mind would do that. Sarah should never have done that, that, you know. And the only answer you can get is, I'm glad she was real for you. <laughs> <laughs> I made her up. She did what I wanted. So you've gotten, you know, 25-ish uh, books out there. How... Um, how important is continuing to go? You talked about going to novelists. Think I know that I met you at Superstars writing seminars in Colorado, mm -hmm. and how how important is that writer community to to a writer? When you're starting, it's very very important, both for just walking into a room and saying, "God, all these people are in the same boat." You know, they understand what I'm saying. Uh, it was sort of like the first time I walked into a Mothers of Twins meeting and saw people still alive, you know. Oh, there's hope. Um, I have gone to fewer of them at this point because you, you reach a point where you're saying, I'm spending a lot of time and a lot of money. None of them are cheap, especially if you have to fly and stay in a hotel and all of that. I want to either be able to give so I want to do a presentation. I want to be able to share what I know uh, or feel like I'm going to get back more. I, I reached the point, quite honestly, with some of the local conferences and stuff where it was I could have given that talk and I could have done it better. Right. Uh, but until you reach that point, you're learning. And yeah. so I used to go to conferences all over the place and take all, you know, how to write and craft and marketing and, and, and all that stuff because I didn't go to school and get an MFA or study marketing or any of that, you know, it's all absorbed over the years. Cool. Awesome. Well, 
<laughs> well, Terry, uh, thank you so much. This has been uh, really insightful, shared all kinds of wonderful things that I wasn't even uh, expecting that we were going to be talking about, which was fantastic. Where can people find out more about you, about your books? Check out your blog, because I know you have stuff for writers. Right. There too. You can start at the at my website, which should be right there at the bottom of your screen. Terry. And that's terryodell.com? And the blog is, is a link there. It's got a page on my books. It's got extra stuff. Um, and follow my blog. We have a lot of fun on that. And at Facebook, you know. Facebook as well. Up into the, it's author Terry O'Dell at Facebook. Excellent. And uh, lots of thank yous popping up. Terry, I want to also say thank you so much for spending the time with me today. And everyone, have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe.